Hi, this is your Supreme Bharatiya and welcome to our early prediction video series. And today we have with us once again Scott Sellers, CEO of Azul. Scott, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Swap. Great to see you again. Great to be uh, to be part of the to part of it uh, as well. It's my pleasure. And of course, I'm going to ask you to share your predictions. But before that, just remind our viewers what is the company all about. So Azul is uh, a company that's focused on delivering a Java platform for enterprise customers that provide value in a, a number of different ways, whether it's uh, economically providing uh, support for the Java runtime for enterprises that are looking for open source alternatives to, um, to for example, the Oracle Java platform. Uh, we provide a, a performance uh, product as well that allows for Java-based applications and infrastructure to perform faster, scale more efficiently, have more deterministic runtime, uh, helps with things like uh, speeds and feeds applications that need uh, tighter latencies, faster performance. It also is very useful for applications that are deployed in the cloud, being able to have more cost-effective infrastructure in the cloud. And then finally, we have uh, tools that help with developer productivity in terms of being able to more rapidly identify and remediate security vulnerabilities and applications, as well as be more efficient in terms of understanding uh, what code is is run, um, what code may needed to be updated and maintained, those types of things. So it really comes down to a more uh, economical foundation, uh, helping our customers develop and, and uh, deploy applications more cost effectively, as well as ultimately making those developers uh, more efficient with their time and prioritization. Now it's time for you to grab your crystal ball and share your predictions with us. <laughs> well, predictions are always tough, and uh, I was I was thinking about this, and and uh, you know I, I hate to be yet another person to to talk about AI, but I, I think in this case it's inevitable that that I'm going to need to. I'll try to take a little bit of a different twist to it because I think a lot of what's happened with AI so far has really been focused on on sort of the the use of AI for um exploratory things and certainly you know in the use of what i think most of us do now in, in our daily lives using um you know the the ai capabilities of say, of say for example a chat gpt or something like that or a copilot to be more effective in searching and researching and and that i would already say is is near mainstream i think what's coming in 2025 on the enterprise side is really incorporating some of the capabilities that these the AI LLMs and, and sort of the derivatives of those in terms of actual real production workloads. And, and what I mean by that is instead of just using uh, these, these LLMs for ad hoc queries and, and those types of things, actually integrating them into um, applications that are really running you know, for enterprises in production that are, are uh, interacting, if you will, or adding value to the end consumer, the end user in ways that just historically that's not been the case. And so there's a number of different areas that we see uh, this playing out. For example, um, a lot of work is going on into recommendation engines to be able to take those to next level, whether that's you know for shopping assistance or being able to you know expose new offerings and capabilities for for uh, for users and shoppers and things like that in the world of finance and banking you know we're seeing a very very strong trend towards using um, ai capabilities in algorithmic trading and other types of platforms that you know in essence allow for those uh, those algos to to take another level of sophistication um, and being able to ultimately allow those trading applications trading firms um, to make smarter decisions and, and and ultimately you know have an advantage in those types of markets um, we see a lot of interest in in legal and compliance areas where now instead of of you know taking hours and hours by by uh, people to review documents and these types of things being able to use uh, AI capabilities to more quickly identify changes, areas of risk, these types of things. Um, in manufacturing, all sorts of work is going on now with supply chain automation and being able to use AI more effectively in those regards. And so, you know, those are there's there's many many more examples, but I'd I'd say the big thing, and I'm not even really sure it's a crystal ball. I think it's it's fairly um, uh, low, low probability of not playing out in the case of, of really AI goes mainstream in the enterprise for production workloads and, and the real, you know, to the benefit of, of the end users who now have richer experiences and, and new capabilities um, and ultimately allows for even more personalization 
um, and allows for more cost-effective deployments for the end enterprises that are serving those customers. My second one, I'm going to go on a, on a theme of um, developer productivity really becomes mainstream. And obviously, you know, this is, this is related to our world and many others that are uh, enterprise software companies that are in in the DevOps space. Um, there's there over the the last number of years, there's been you know many companies that have started and and have products that are um, involved with trying to measure developer productivity. Um, take action to improve developer productivity. And, you know, we certainly still are in a market environment where um, there's not easy free free budget dollars to just continue to hire more and more developers. Um, features are being demanded by the business at, at rates uh, that developers simply can't keep up with. At the same time, you have a never-ending stream of security vulnerabilities that the operators and the developers have to wrestle with and manage. And so, you know, how do you, how do you how do you yeah, how does how does a development team get their get their heads around this? And so, I think in 2025, what we're going to see is is the, the developer productivity in terms of of monitoring and actually taking action really becomes. Uh, becomes real, becomes common uh, in terms of, of developer teams taking advantage of, the, of these tools to measure their developer productivity, and then ultimately using using similar, if not different, tools to actually do something about it. Right, in terms of being able to help developers prioritize their time and attention, stop wasting time searching for solutions, but provide them front and center uh, areas that uh, need work. Whether that's improving Things like um, identifying real vulnerabilities uh, in their applications and fixing them and stop uh, waiving them or ignoring them because at the end of the day, all it takes is, is one breach and uh, people start losing jobs. And so, you know, the, the ability for developers to actually keep their heads above water and, and focus on, on secure, um, security vulnerabilities that matter uh, is a big one. I think also, you know, one of the things that we see is that developers are spending an enormous amount of time updating code, maintaining code that is actually not even run in production. So an incredible uh, wasted resource of developer time and attention. There are now tools, as well obviously provides one as well, that help developers really understand um, the code that matters and the code that needs to be updated and maintained, again, improving developer efficiency. So. You know, I think those are those are very big and real themes that are, are going to go going to go from being talked about um, and being discussed about the potential in previous years to being really more mainstream and, and truly improving the developer um, uh, productivity. My final prediction for 2025, as I would say, um, FinOps um, goes mainstream. Uh, FinOps, of course, is is the the practice of measuring. Um, uh, cloud spend in terms of, of you know who's spending it, what applications are spending it, what groups are spending it, really mapping you know the big cloud bill back to um, individual groups and owners. So ultimately, um, the, those that are paying for those cloud resources can get a better sense as to you know how those resources, uh, how those um, how that cloud spend is being spent and what to do about it. Because I don't think there's a CIO on the planet that's currently happy with their cloud spend. There's always um, are areas that can be um, better optimized and, and you know, the, the spend um, better justified. So I think now what we're seeing is that um, FinOps practices were, were on the priority list of, of years past in terms of building those practices and providing that connection between cloud spend and, and the, those that are spending it. Now we're seeing that mainstream. You're seeing big vendors like IBM. Uh, purchase uh, uh, companies like Aptio, for example, you're seeing moves that are being made by um, um, Flexera and others. And so, you know, what we're finding now is is this is absolutely not just becoming a nice to have, it's becoming a, a foundation um, for any company that's doing anything in the cloud, which is most of them, that along with that, you're seeing sound FinOps practices and then actions taken to be able to, to uh, use that information that's that's coming from the FinOps practitioners and actually um, have material impact in terms of optimizing cloud spend. So those are my three for the year. What kind of challenges are you seeing will be there 
this year for the whole ecosystem. By ecosystem, I mean, of course, customers, users, and even for company like Azul to navigate through. Again, I'm going to go with the, with the AI theme. Um, I like to try to be original, but it's, uh, it's hard to ignore it because um, AI in general is causing a tremendous amount of, let's just say, I'm going to use the word distraction for lack of a better term. And by that, I don't mean that, that people's investments and in investigations of AI is somehow um, not justified. Of course, it absolutely is. But it's also a major distraction because when you have a technology like AI that is moving so quickly, I think many of, of the, the, the enterprises, for example, that are you know being demanded by by the public markets, by their investors, by you know the higher ups within their organizations, by their boards. What is your AI strategy? How is AI impacting us? Uh, how are we using AI to better our business? Is AI um, a threat, a friend or a foe to us? You know, these are questions that are very important because inevitably, AI um, uh, will have will cause radical change in in many companies and many organizations. So. Getting back specifically to your question, what are the challenges? The challenges are all about, um, you know, getting your head around the impact that AI will have and, and coming forth with strategies. Uh, if you're an enterprise, it's picking areas where AI is, is adding value and staying away from, you know, the areas that are more speculative at this point. And there definitely are very real areas where AI is proven to be adding value today. And that certainly, as we speak with our customers, highly advise them in, in focusing on the things that work as opposed to things that are still very much, you know, in pie in the sky. And there's a lot of media attention that gets focused on the pie in the sky things. Um, but there are very practical things that are happening that that here and now enterprises should be prioritizing because it does ultimately have an impact on their business. And so kind of cutting through the chaff and, and, and really um, finding those areas where AI is adding value today, I think, is a challenge. I think in the world of enterprise software vendors like Azul, it's a similar story, but it's one that you know we and, and others in the in the ISV community um, are definitely um, you know, view AI as an opportunity to continue to add value in our products and being able to deliver um, you know, new and novel capabilities due to advancements in AI technology and the and the uh, uh, the capabilities that that provides, and so that challenge for the ISV community is, is again, how do you identify um, real value that AI can provide given the, the, the current state of AI and, uh, and prioritize developing those sorts of features relative to many other features that, that possibly are being considered for, uh, for future enhancements to products. So um, definitely AI in general is creating challenges across the board for enterprises to uh, Again, get a, getting away a bit from the head spinning and getting down to you know real business and real prioritization. Now, if you look at these predictions and challenges, what is going to be the focus of Azul this year? Azul is, is all about continuing to uh, continuing on with the momentum that we've established over the last several years. And when you, Azul is a incredibly uh, high growth company, um, you know, not only are we are we growing rapidly, um, we're we're a very a healthy company in terms of, of profitably growing. And, you know, I think that is something that, as you've seen over the last several years, um, many companies weren't in that state and they've had to do some pretty significant changes in terms of their operating model to be able to, of course, grow, but do so in a way that's profitable. And, and Azul has had that foundational uh, belief for a long, long time. So we certainly want to continue to uh, to operate in that regard. We're very excited about that. Um, we have a long, long list of things that we want and plan to add on on the our three primary products. We're very excited about the future direction of all of those and, and the market potential. Um, certainly, as you mentioned, for example, in the case of, of Oracle and what they're doing uh, with their Java platform and continuing to charge outrageous amounts, we're still we still believe as a business we're kind of at the tip of the iceberg in terms of that market potential and being able to continue to help enterprises uh, migrate off Oracle Java and save them truly literally millions of dollars um, by moving to an open source solution like uh, like Azure Platform Core. Uh, we're super excited with the momentum that we see uh, in in what's going on with cloud and and obviously more and more. Um, adoption of cloud, but but even within that, for example, um, really interesting things going on in terms of like the preference for 
ARM64 processors as opposed to x86, given the, the, the price performance advantages of those. Um, being able to do that with Java is very straightforward because, of course, Java by architecture um, is you, you write it once and you can run it on any platform, whether it's x86, ARM, what have you. And so as, as enterprises continue to, to try to find more cost effective ways of deploying in the cloud, using ARM processors, for example, like like uh, the Graviton processors from AWS is uh, now very much front and center. It's very straightforward to be able to 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 move from an x86 approach to uh, a x86 architecture to uh, uh, an ARM processor when you're using Java or even do mixed mode. We see that oftentimes as well, where customers are using spot instances. It doesn't matter if they grab an x86 or an ARM, they'll use what's ever available. So that's, I, I think, very exciting. So. You know, we we think in general, as as the markets unfold, we're in a great space. Java continues to uh, to be a flywheel that appears to be uh, unstoppable and just continues to gain momentum um, in the directions of where enterprises um, want to continue to prioritize and develop their applications and, and ultimately, um, you know, create more value for themselves and, and for their end customers. Scott, thank you so much for taking time out today and share these predictions with us. And as usual, I look forward to chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Swap.